convict timber culvert still survives. So the location on Simpson's track, if you can remember that earlier image, is where it says Timber Culver's new concrete pipe, right in the middle of the track going down 10 mile hollow. So this is the Simpson's track itself. And that in the foreground there, where this, you can see the branches going across the track, that's the location of the culvert. And those branches and things are nothing to do with the culvert themselves. They've just been chucked in there so people can get their four wheel drives across. Again, that's what the culvert looks like from the surface. So we went out and basically dug a trench across the track one Sunday and exposed pretty good remains of the timber culvert, which is really great to see. And um, I was thinking of showing you this when we were talking, I think, about drains in Newcastle. And this is similar to the early drains in Newcastle as well, just been built of timber. So just a few images, and it was, we, I was quite surprised. It was um, considering it was meant to be completely burnt out and um, collapsed. There was a fair bit of the timber culvert still remaining. Whether it's the same one built by the convicts or one, because I'm sure they had to um, rebuild the timber culverts, but still the remnants of it are still quite great. And on your left there, you can see there's a, a kind of sandstone built retaining wall or wing wall where the um, outlet for the for the drain come coming down the hill and so as the um the timber culvert was in pretty good nick well the remains of it were you know we decided that it was obviously the best option not to put the concrete pipe there but to put it alongside so it still drain the track the concrete but the culvert, the timber culvert, would still be retained in situ and not further harmed. And so that's what National Parks and Wildlife did. They dug a trench alongside it. The timber culvert itself was protected before having nice clean sand put on top of that geofabric. The concrete pipe was installed adjacent to it. And you can see the concrete pipe on the left, the trench for the culvert on the right, and then the road surface was um, replaced on it on the track so it's once again can function as a track this is a little plan of what we found you can see on the right there the the wing walls or retaining walls of um sandstone and then the remnants of the timber culvert itself which essentially was two long logs laid on either the natural sandstone or on some pieces of sandstone you can see cut sandstone blocks on the left there where the just so they could get a level starting point with the long logs and then he just laid timber capping beams across the top. So that's all remains in situ and the, the wing walls on the, on the end, the retaining walls, they're still there. So if you're going along the track, you can still understand where the original timber culvert was. It was um, the dates from the 1828 possibly. And now, um, if you, I'm not too sure how many people have been on the Great North Road, particularly the more northern part. But while I was there, I went to have a look at the at Clare's Bridge. And I just thought you might be interested to see what Clare's Bridge looks like and what's left there, if anyone's been there in the past. That's just an image of um, you know, a similar road gang construction going on at um, Mount York, Bathurst Plains. So Clare's Bridge, it's um, a little bit further north from the um, junction with Simpson's track in the old Great North Road. And this is just a photograph of the interpretation plaque that's there. If you want to have a, a read of that before I show you a few, few of the photos. So it's constructed between January and September 1830. And at the time of this plaque, it was thought to be the second oldest bridge on mainland Australia. And the sandstone blocks used to um, construct the bridge, which is from the surrounding hillside. And there's no decking on it, but it has been had decking on it replaced in at least three occasions. I'll move on just with some. So this is the 
the Great North Road, the track, as it is approaching Clare's Bridge. It's just beautiful out there. And this is the sandstone bridge, the, the, the abutments of it and things itself. And it's really quite impressive. But again, I'm not too sure how many, you know, the opportunity to get out that far of the Great North Road doesn't um, happen often. So I just thought people might be interested in seeing a few photos. It's really quite spectacular. And that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, I get progress updates from one of the groups that has a big interest in the Great North Road. Um, have you done any work with those people out there? The Convict Trail people? Yeah, yeah. Uh, not, not so. I had a small bit to do with them um, a long time ago on the very the northern bit of it, which was close to the, you know, closer to the mine sites and things when the mm. when one of the mines was looking at doing something, but in the end, thankfully didn't do anything, just, but just sort of the very furthest northern um, where it's just really the alignments and there aren't any, mm. any physical works there. So those last um, ruins that you were showing us, what, what is there, are there going to be anything done with those or, um, cause they well, look like Mayan ruins at the moment. Um, they do. Yeah. I mean, I think the, um, the plaque itself, but the plaque, goodness only knows how old it is, does say that the conservation works were completed in 2004 by the Convict Trail project. And there is, okay. you know, further future con conservation works include, you know, possibly building timber decking in keeping with the original convict construction. So when or whether that can ever happen. And, you know, of course, money is always the big driving factor so yeah but it's, it was really cool to see it was yeah it was great to get out there yeah because I, I can't imagine too many people have traveled out there no, in recent years it is um, quite a trek to get up to claire's bridge i can tell you as well yeah <laughs> does anyone have any uh, questions for tim yeah uh, look i wasn't uh, listening i wasn't uh, tuned in to to the start i'm sorry but um tim have you, have, did you show any pictures of the frog hollow uh, uh, bridge uh, work there? No, so uh, it was just a little bit of work we've been doing with national parks on the timber culverts on Simpsons track. Right. And um, while I was there, I just visited, you know, Claire's Bridge and just wanted to, because I've never been there and I'm not too sure how many of you guys have. So I just wanted to, thought it was an opportunity to show some pretty pictures. Yes, well, I, I really, uh, uh, I used to travel the track quite a bit. Uh, yeah. From um, what's the uh, where's the turn off from the uh, the road there? I mean the, the Wiseman's Ferry. Uh, well, Wiseman's Ferry, but you come up from uh, Mogo Creek at the top yeah. of the there. Um, but <clears throat> you know, the uh, we used to travel down there quite a lot. But to get through Simpsons pa Simpsons Pass, I think it is. Do you know that spot? Yeah, Simpsons. Simpsons Park is the Simpsons Pass. No, uh, it's it's well, you more or less had to carry your car across in in, in those day, in the yeah. days we were going there, and there was always the uh, uh, there was there was the uh, PMG uh, um, wires going through yes. there. Yes, you, have you got any photographs of that? No, I haven't. Because that time. that was. Uh, you know, there's nothing of it now, but um, it was obviously used quite a lot by the uh, Telegraph PMG. Yes. Um, but we we you know used used the track a bit, quite a bit when we were trying to when we were working for the national parks to get the national parks there. Uh, but to Frog Hollow you used to come up from uh, from Mangrove Mountain and go down into Mangrove. Mangrove uh, Creek, I suppose it is, and there was a couple of creeks there with lots of uh, Aboriginal uh, yep. uh, works in the in the uh, <clears throat> the hills around, and then you come across uh, the, the the Frog Hollow uh, stonework, and it was just absolutely amazing. 
you know, it was actually, uh, they were per, uh, perfect arches. I, I've forgotten, I, I haven't, I, I want to go back there, but the thing is, I, I'm getting that old, I find it hard to, but I used, we used to drive, <laughs> drive the Holden down, down there before the, when we were looking for the, get it, trying to get the park yeah. uh, dedicated. Um, oh dear. It's uh, so many great memories of, uh, of, of, the, of the old uh, Convict Road. Uh, yeah. But anyway, it's, uh, it's a great yeah, I was really, I'm really, I'm really, uh, really, really interesting to catch up with with this, but um, I want to get back and photograph that stonework because it was just like, just like in, um, like the switchback rail railway at um, Lithgow, you know, coming down the hill there. It, okay. they, they, they were really that, uh, it was just absolutely amazing. The amount of work that the convicts put into it, they must have had some good stone masons, I reckon. Uh, even those abutments that you can see and, and the, um, um, corbels uh, yeah. there to hold the the um, uh, uh, hold the uh, timber work, you know, just made, uh, really, really quite very interesting. It's it, great. I do have some photos of the Divine Hill Ascent, which has got those um, some oh. quite spectacular abutments, which you can show another time. And um, I'll try and see if we can get back there and. Um, I'm not too sure. I haven't been to Frog Hollow, but I have swum in Mangrove Creek. You mentioned, yeah. but I haven't been to. <laughs> well, they've done a lot of new work going down into it um, with uh, the firefighting people. Of, of, yep. uh, they've been down there quite a lot where we used to go. But we used to walk up and then go over for go over right and come back and walk back along. Oh, I've forgotten the roads now. So long ago. Um, but at any rate, it was in the 50s, I can't, uh, my, my brain doesn't uh, remember things, unfortunately. I wish I'd, I probably got photographs of them, but there's so many heaps of photographs around the place, I wouldn't know how to find them. <laughs> yeah, can I just say, um, I had the privilege of um, going to the Great North Road. Um, you asked if anyone had been there, and I've been to the Wiseman Berry End when um, Governor Marie Bashir um, uh, unveil the Engineers Australia Heritage marker there. Um, and it was one of her first uh, functions that she performed after she became governor. And I remember when she spoke, she was really thrilled to be there because she obviously done her homework and she knew all about Governor Darling. And it was really a very special occasion and we all had a chance to walk up and have a look at some of the um, sandstone structures. So um, yeah, it's a very special place. I think, uh, can you hear me? Right. Yep, Let's, yep. Uh, thank you, Tim, for that. When I was um, a lot younger and a lot fitter, uh, I worked on the Great North Road when we were trying to restore and save some of the sandstone. It's a long time ago. And uh, as I say, a lot younger and a lot fitter. And it's a beautiful place. It took us about three months work, going out about two days a week. Lovely. Good experience. Thank you. Can I just quickly add, Tim, those photographs are amazing, particularly the, the last few that showed um, how intact it still is. Um, it featured, I don't know if anyone's been watching on ABC, Back to Nature, where they're going and looking at some remote locations um, and telling stories from an Indigenous perspective, but they, they featured part of the Great North Road um, and, and they sort of made the point that I think the convicts spent decades building it and that was only used for a really short time because they found a quicker route up through the Hunter um, and up north. But um, they also sort of made the point that with um, people travelling regionally, that it might actually put the spotlight or focus on some of these unique places basically in our backyard. So, you know, that could be the upside that um, people get out to visit and then appreciate places like this because it is quite significant isn't it like as you pointed out so yeah those photos are fantastic thanks tim uh, any other questions just shout out because i can't see everyone <laughs> <laughs>
other than that, um, thank you very much, Tim. I'm looking forward to what uh, you and the team find out at Wickham, um, given that Kawabari ground um, work that was done a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, that'd be really, uh, really interesting. So if you can organise another presentation for us, that'd be great. All right, wonderful. Um, so I guess we'll move on to updates and um, and news uh, <clears throat> that we've received. Uh, we've got a lot of um, people that we're losing at the moment. Um, one of them is uh, uh, Ian Sim, um, who passed away a, a week ago. Um, Ian uh, was a recorder of Aboriginal engraving sites during the 1950s, 1960s and 70s. Um, we had the um, privilege of interviewing him in 2019 for a series of interviews, um, and he was just an amazing wealth of information. Um, he was a land surveyor in the this, this Sydney area and a keen bush water, walker, and he'd been recruited um, by, I think it was Kevin McCarthy, who was one of the... Um, one of the rock art uh, specialists at the Australian Museum um, to really do some work for him. So, and a lot of the surveys that, that we used when we went out there to view these things were his surveys. So when Gary Jones finally tracked him down and he was still living um, and was um, happy to come and speak to us, we were just over the moon. So anyway, we pay his, um, his, his family um, all our condolences and um, he passed away age 90. Uh, in addition, we lost um, Richard Belfield, um, who was the grandson of Algernon Henry Belfield uh, of the weather records. And also just a matter of days ago, Martin Babakin, who originally introduced us to Richard back in 2009. So the pair of them were basically responsible for bringing those historic record, weather records to the attention of um, uh, our Professor Howard Bridgman here and Dr. Lyndon Ashcroft down in Melbourne when she was overseas. And, um, and they've really been now put onto the world stage as part of the... Of the um, climate data that is used to to do our climate modeling um, anyway we created a bit of a, a tribute page for Richard with all the various excerpts of his um, of his um, um, speeches that he'd given over the over the time um, for his family and um, that went up on the hunter living history site so condolences to both those families um, as well um, the stories of our town and um, Fortress Newcastle have upcoming films. Um, the Castanet Club, for those of you who remember the Castanets uh, from the 1980s, they were a comedy musical troupe that used to perform in the back of the Clarendon Hotel. Um, and basically all of them just went to form careers uh, nationally. Um, so there's been about an hour long film that's been produced as part of the stories of our town. It'll be coming out soon, probably this month. I'm trying to get an exact date from Glenn Norman, but that'll be coming out soon. And the Fortress Newcastle film, these are both hour long productions um, that were done in collaboration with some of the people in, in this list. Um, Ron Barber from the fort, and as well as the um, people connected with the Fortress Newcastle, as well as the veterans that are scattered throughout Sydney and, and New South Wales. Um, that will be coming out on the 11th of November 2021. So they're in the final stages of production of that film, just doing the sound and, and animations. So um, that's been fantastic. And and did you want to talk about our um, Rachel and the sort of work she's going to be doing, hopefully, with with Fortress Newcastle? Do you want to jump in there? Yeah, yeah, sure thing. So Rachel, who um, yeah, is joining us today, she's started uh, a week ago working on the Fortress Newcastle project. So welcome, Rachel, to the team. <laughs> and we'll be uh, working, Rachel will be with us two days a week until the end of January. And um, she's going to meet some of the Fortress Newcastle team tomorrow, um, looking at how she can contribute in um, sourcing some materials from special collections and working with the community on, um, on those project panels and 
get involved, yeah, with, with quite a big team. So um, I think that'd be a really good opportunity and it's, um, it's always good working with interns from other universities. And um, Rachel, did you want to say anything at all or um, don't want to, no? <laughs> Other than I'm um, just very happy to be involved in the project and I'm excited to see where this goes and um, be part of obviously something that's a lot, a much bigger um, initiative. But um, yeah, thank you for welcoming me and I look forward to possibly meeting a few of you over the coming weeks. So it is um, a little bit more challenging doing a virtual placement, but yeah, we're hoping that um, to be able to sort of spend some time um, even if it's not for another couple of months in special collections and, and get some skills um, digitising. Um, the, from the ground up, um, that was the History Week um, uh, event that happened, I think, just after our last meeting. So we had um, a session with some of the special collections team and we recorded that and that's available online. So I've just added it to that earlier um, post that was um, promoting the project. And um, Dr. Amir Mogadon, who's, I think Amir's with us at the meeting today, he compiled a post. Um, he talked specifically on the Radoni glass negatives and that post is available as well if people want to um, learn a little bit more about the background of, um, of that collection and, and the glass negatives. Um, so that's online. In okay, do you want me to continue? Oh yeah, I wasn't sure whether you're, you're still doing your report or. Well, I can. I'm, I'm happy to spin off into into yeah. different directions as as the topic. So just back with there you go, and Ron. Before you go on, uh, in relation to that film. Yep. Uh, one of the things they talked about was all the rumours they'd heard about all the uh, tunnels and so on that it allegedly exists. They had originally excluded it from the uh, film, but they've now added it back in and Glenn was after photos of the tunnels and that sort of thing the other day, which I was able to supply. So oh, good on they, you. They're going to deal with that story in it. <laughs> oh, well, that's great. There's quite a lot in there and um, I've yeah. seen the rough... Oh, rough tapes and yeah. it's great yeah it's really good you know got you laughing and crying in various parts which is really <laughs> really good and they just bring me in to fill in all the gaps so, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not really an expert but the great thing about the work that Rachel hopefully will be doing is um, on the line of women's histories so uh, underneath all this is really trying to uh, find out a bit more about what um, the women and girls were doing at that time and um, there's some wonderful things I mean we've got a wonderful collection of the New South Wales country women's magazines basically from about 1937 to 1945 so you're very good to, to put a bit more information about about the role of women while uh, 900,000 uh, men were overseas was that right Ron around that figure yeah Yep. Anyway, so look forward to those films. I think they're going to be mm. really, I mean, these films will probably be international, uh, national in scope. Um, so especially the, the Captain next one, even because it's just all these characters have gone off and you've seen them in comedy shows everywhere and the Fortress Newcastle, well, that, that just has implications around everything. So hopefully they should be picked up by, by our, our national broadcaster at some point. Anyway, um, on recognition, uh, I received an email on the 15th of September from Tim Crackenthorpe, our member for Newcastle. Now, New South Wales has a blue plaques program going. Now, I don't know how many people in the various groups got these emails, but um, and I didn't know how much to do, but we sent them off um, 12 places. Now, the program is still going on, so if there are other people that my list is going to... Um, to stimulate with you, then put together a bit of a, of a brief and send it into Tim. They've all got to go in through him. So we sent him through a spreadsheet answering all the questions he had to answer. Um, but the ones we nominated were the convict coal mines under Fort Scratchley, 
uh, we called them the birthplace of the Australian economy because that's where we started making uh, <laughs> money for, for, the, for the Australian nation. So that's at Fort Drive. Um, James Hardy Vox, um, the author uh, and compiler of the first Orchid biography and dictionary in the country. And we suggested that for the Convict Lumberyard. Um, Biriban and Threlkeld at the Newcastle West KFC because that's where they, they met and they began their language studies and into the Awabakal language or the Newcastle language as it was known then. The Scott Sisters um, at 9 Watt Street. Um, now, Tim, you worked on that site and the developer who, and that building is quite, the people that own that building are quite, um, Oh, well, they, they were fantastic. They, they created a mural inside the place. So we're thinking that they might be, um, they might be happy to, to host a blue plaque to the Scott sisters um, because the family lived there, uh, I think, in the 1840s, memory serves. Um, James Tucker, uh, a.k.a. Ralph Rashley, Rashley um, we suggested uh, that one for the parkland opposite Murray Avenue. Um, at the top of town there overlooking um, the Bards. Uh, Mark Twain, um, famous for his tooth extraction um, between 34 and 36 Bolton Street. I've spoken to one of the, of the uh, property owners there. Um, um, what's his name? Dean Winter, who wanted to name his place Twain's tooth anyway. So, I mean, I'd be happy if that came through. Henry Lawson for the Wickham School of Arts, Florence Ostrell on the corner of Lehman in Auckland, Alexander Galloway, the composer of those two tunes on Lake Macquarie in Newcastle. He was also living in a property called Cloverley in Murray Avenue. I don't know if the building still exists, but it was in Murray Avenue as well. Very interesting street, Murray Avenue. I think it needs its own little history. Um, the marriage of Jean Ross and Edmund Barton, our first prime minister, um, that's 26 Watt Street. Dymphna Cusack in 1 Murray Avenue and Yahoo Sirius at 90 Hunter Street, uh, which is uh, the lockup area where part of the um, movie was filmed. So there was our suggestions. We emailed them off to Tim and he responded a couple of days ago to basically say that he was preparing nominations and would submit nominations for all of them. So that same email went to our historians at the university and it's just open if you've got any names. Look, it's literally pro probably double that that we could recommend. But if any you think it being very important, uh, let us know and, um, and we'll get them, we'll let you know how to send them off to Tim. Yeah, I've just put the link in the chat, Gioni. So okay. anyone, um, yeah, there might be history groups and national trusts that might be interested in, in putting some nominations together. But it's actually not too lengthy a process. They're not after a lot of information, just as long as it's got some links that verify um, and you know the location. Yeah, basically the format is the name of the MP, that's him. Uh, who or what are you nominating? The name of the thing. Why are you nominating it? So they're looking for things, you know, things like Twain and Lawson have a, a broad reaching appeal. Um, that's something we need to think about. Um, the name of, of the place where the plaque is to be installed, the street address, the LGA. In this case, because it's Tim suggesting it, it'd be Newcastle. But I just wonder if the other M. Um, other members have gotten similar things for their LGAs. Um, and then the suggested text for the plaque, which is 100 words or less. And if you're aware of any other places um, that where this event or story or person has been uh, already recognised. So on the list was Wybagamba originally, which is the Aboriginal name for Nobbies. But when I had a look at Nobbies, we've got a nice little um, new installation there that council has set up recently or maybe the Port Corp or maybe whoever it is that looks after there's quite a number of hands in that area um, so why the gambas were well and truly looked after so pick something that you probably think is a bit more obscure someone deserving or some event that's deserving um, so yeah it's uh, it's quite a great opportunity I hope it gets up but um, we were able to use some material that we gathered um, through our interactions with the Newcastle writers centre a few years ago that had a similar idea um, to do something around historic writers. So I've got some more I could probably use there, but I just didn't know, you know, I didn't 
want to flood Tim with too many recommendations. Any questions on that one? So, Johnny, uh, James Cacaldi would be a suitable person, would he? Probably. He was, he was the original uh, battery commander at Fort Scratchley. Yeah, yeah, you could suggest him. Yeah, yeah, why not? Okay, thank you. But they would also probably recommend who, who the Fort Scratchley is named after. But yes. I mean, the same thing came in about the, the Star Hotel. I thought the Star Hotel is, is a plaque in itself, as Fort Scratchley <laughs> would be. So you don't need any more. I mean, someone's got something named after them. I guess this is sort of to, to try and tease out a few of the people that have been lost um, in the mix. But yeah, you know, he, he's, I don't think he's got a, any, any other, um, yeah remembrances around the place so that's who you... all right okay uh, moving on we've been invited to participate in a, a green bands jack mundy exhibition with the city of newcastle now um i sent a few emails out to people just to find out because i didn't know too much about the green bands in newcastle so thank you doug thank you howard um and rose cogger as well have responded um to our emails on on that it looks like if anyone's got any any information um or um knowledge of people um involved with any green band type of action here and the only one that i've been able to think was a uh, was one was the newcastle east i don't know of any others doug let me know if i need no. to be corrected um but if there's anyone that they might be able to still um, interview, we're interested in people that, um, that might have been involved um, at the time. Uh, it's interesting for me because we hold the Newcastle Trades Hall Council uh, records and archives. So if, and I've been given some key names and events to look through um, with those. So, so thank you very much. So if anyone's got any information along those lines, um, please let us know and um, we'll let the organisers, um, uh, we'll notify the organisers because um, they're wanting to, to host the exhibition up from Sydney, but also supplement it um, with local, local stories. Okay. Um, at the moment, we're also undergoing a, a UON uh, libraries upgrade. So we've just had a new library catalogue that went live um, and I can copy that link into the chat um, for everyone. Hang on. Um, it's our new library um, search page. And um, in addition, there's been quite a, a, a a bit of work that's been going on moving all our listings and original site that, that's been living on the LibGuide site for many years over to the Living History site. So that involves the moving of our archival finding aids, introduction to rare books and special collections, and our digital scriptorium sites that hosted our Coke 100 River sites and Aboriginal source book. So just bear with us while that move is going on. Um, I went through and and tried to have a look at all the um, the links on our Hunter Living Histories um, dreaming pages. So that took quite some time. And it's not just our links I'm fixing up, I'm also fixing up a lot of links that we connected to at the State Library site. So the dreaming site's done. Uh, if you see of any other links that are scattered throughout the blog, let us know and I'll try and, and fix them up as well. And I'm gonna start on the history pages uh, next. So it's just, you know, updating links when every so often websites are renovated and changed and um, there's a lot of, of this work that needs to be done. Um, now, um, there's a free online living digital heritage conference that's going to be held um, from Friday the 5th to Sunday the 7th of November 2021. It's being hosted by the Centre of Ancient Cultural Heritage and Environment, uh, or CASH, at Macquarie Uni. Um, and again, I can um, copy the link of this into the chat. And if you wish to register, <clears throat> uh, you can register and attend the event. Um, but they're, um, they're going to be 
covering a wide range of digital methods and their applications to heritage related pursuits, in particular, the domain of virtual heritage. So sorts of experiments that we undertook with Deep Time and um, the Victoria Theatre along those sorts of lines of using three dimensional virtual heritage. So that should be fun and it's a free event. So, um, you know, just have a go. Um, now, uh, Marla, I, I've just got a, um, an update here on the UON libraries. So from today, um, the York Community and Arimba libraries um, will be extending their hours uh, from nine to five. Um, and the information common will be extended to 9 p.m. Now that's largely to support staff and students. So we're still not open to the, to the wider community. And we're not quite sure what the latest is when we will start our return. Marla, are you are you out there? Can you uh, do you yep. want to jump in? Thanks, Johnny. <laughs> That's the latest um, news I've got from official. Yeah. But, uh, I'm hoping to have some more information after a meeting this afternoon. Um, but for the moment, we are still fairly locked down, and I, oh, <laughs> um, and we are only really providing access for essential research activities for students and academics. Um, once hopefully the um, vaccination passport is linked to the QR code uh, check-in, we might be able to facilitate more access at that point. Thank you, Marla. That's great. Okay, um, we this this evening um, there will be a webinar on the month of murder video series. So um, you would have seen a blog post that we shared uh, recently um, with regards to the Wanarua people and their st stories relating to massacres in the vicinity of the Raymondsworth homestead in the Hunter Valley. Now, we did some work quite some time ago uh, tracking the um, colonial history of that site. And it was interesting because I heard information about um, the Aboriginals, uh, Aboriginal history of the area too, but there wasn't much um, that had been coming forward. Now, the Greens MLC in the upper house um, of um, New South Wales State Parliament, David Shoebridge, uh, has been working with um, those people because of the mine's intention to move the original um, homestead. Um, and they've, they've created four stories, which they released um, during the month of August. So we've posted all four stories, but the webinar this evening, which you can register and I'll send you the link, um, will put you in contact or will we'll, we'll be presented by the actual people that helped create the film. So I'm just putting in the link to the webinar there. So there's plenty of links going in the chat. Um, and last of all is the New South Wales State Archives and Records intend to reopen uh, their reading room in the Western Sydney Records Centre, effective from Tuesday the 19th of October. So they're still fine tuning the arrangements, but uh, all visitors will need to be fully vaccinated or have a medical exemption and will need to show proof and compliance. So um, now look, I think I'm going to be called away for a second. So I would do I missed that last bit, but it might have been over to me. I'm not sure. Um, I'll just share in the chat. We've also been working on uploading some of the MBN archive um, news items to the uh, YouTube channel. So they're not going up on Living Histories as yet, but I'll just ch share that link. So you can just get like a, a taste of what some of the, the news items are. Um, uh, so they're sort of the 1982 really early ones. I think there's about just over 100 of them up online. Um, there's many more to, to go up, but um, that's something that's slowly progressing. Um, and once we've got, like, once we're back on site and particularly got volunteers working on, on the project, um, yeah, that sh we should be able to sort of progress a little bit quicker. Um, there. For Mental Health Week, I might just quickly share my screen. Um, just this post that's gone up today for Mental Health Week. And it's just to um, share some of the images we've got on Living Histories that relate to the James Fletcher site. So we just selected um, some of the Ralph Snowball glass images um, that are a little bit further down the post um, that relate to the, the the um, 
the former military barracks site. So, so the post um, just sort of sets out a summary of like the history of the site. It actually turns, oh, well, it took its first patient 150 years ago on the 6th of October. So just last week, um, yeah, commemorates that 150 years, but just describes the, um, the type of care that was implemented from the site. It was a specialist institution. It was the first regional government um, asylum in New South Wales. And um, also describes some of the patients, some of the staff that worked on the site and sort of just puts in context how it differed to the, um, the Newcastle, the Sydney um, institutions. Uh, there's some contemporary photographs. So all the former military buildings are still intact on site and they're in reasonably good care because they've been maintained by, um, by health for over three centuries. So it's um, yeah, quite an quite a interesting site. Um, Excuse me, Anne. Yeah. Anne, can yes. I ask a question? That photo there with um, James Fletcher's statue. Yes. Um, on the right hand side, there's a drinking fountain. Yes. No, the, that one there. There's a yeah. drinking fountain with, um, with uh, I think, a cast iron thing shrouding around it. Just a question to everyone is um, uh, Does anyone know where that might have gone? Um, it, is that the sort of thing which. Uh, um, you I don't on that know. image, Anne? Yeah, I clicked on it. Um, yeah. Um, Actually, that's come up before, Robert. Um, and Because yeah, I'm looking for something for Lambton Park, yeah. the Lambton's 150th, um, and, um, and I spotted that this morning, and I thought, well, I know there's no connection between that and Lambton, but it just looks like the sort of thing that might have gone into the council works depot yep. as opposed to the museum. Yeah. And take care. Because <laughs> yeah. um, fountains didn't fare well during the war. Okay. All right. But, uh, we know that the Steger fountain might have been melted down. Melted down, down that's what I was going to say. And, uh, okay. Yeah. I'll pursue that through uh, Tim Smith. But it's such an ornate, uh, ornate um fountain isn't it look at it it's yeah and there's so much detail like even in here like see the obelisk up here but also yes. like all these institutions had the incinerators the chimneys so imagine like the environment and the pollution for those people that are living up on the hill um but yes. yeah there's a lot of detail what i sort of yep. added that one um because the first superintendent of the newcastle asylum didn't have a bit medical background he was a landscape gardener and a clerk so he took um, took on like beautifying the the um, the grounds, planting gardens and vegetables, and then he continued across the road, and that's why we've got Fletcher Park. He sort of um, early early sort of um, gardener and laid out like a lot of the um, plantings around that site. There's also a fantastic plan that. Um, is held by um, Hunter New England Health and we scanned it. Sorry that it's blue. <laughs> um, but it was done by James Barnett, who was a government architect. So what, what he's done here, he sort of added to what was a pretty sort of um, sterile looking um, military site, but um, drew up the design for the landscape, the gardens, a lot of detail. Um, and he's sort of written on here, you know, there's aviaries for pigeons. There was um, all sorts of like little fenced off areas um, where they had, I think they had chickens. I think they had pigs. It was like, um, yeah, quite, quite different to how it used to be, but quite ornate having little grottos and um, new garden beds. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's a really fantastic plan that um, just shows how the outside of the, um, the gardens were used. And this is the main drive off Watt Street, showed like the, the Grecian vases and, um, you know, that the site changed a lot in that decade of um, the 1870s. 
Um, so look, there's also added down the bottom a timeline so you can sort of see the different name changes of the institution and then the earlier uses of the site. And this is where often there's a lot of confusion when you look at photographs. Um, if you're researching a particular site, just understanding that form of use so that you can do all those search terms of, um, of you know, relating to what the site used to be used for. Also, at the University of Newcastle, we've got the Future of Madness Network, and this is a network of academics that um, researching mental health histories. And so they've got like, um, often have forums and seminars and conferences. So anyone who's sort of has an interest in that area of, of history, um, yeah, have a look at that link with the, um, with the network. Great, thank you, Anne. Uh, now, if you ever have any troubles with that blue mask error in um, Mozilla, I've put in the chat how you get rid of it. <laughs> I'll so, use it. <laughs> yes, you can use it. Um, it's in the. I can't fix it if it happens in Chrome, but it's a very frustrating issue with some of the high res images. It has this blue mask come over the top, um, and it's in Mozilla. It's caused by a GFX error in the color management so they put all these defaults in there so you have to go in and and change them back but when you do so the images appear quite 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 beautiful all right back to the agenda where are we up to okay uh next up we've got a fraternal society project update by amir you there amir yep yeah, okay well, over here. to you have you do no, sunshine <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, everyone. For those who might not know me, my name is Amir and I am university conservator. Um, for the moment, I turn off my camera so I can make sure that you can hear me well and I see how it goes. Um, I you came across crystal clear, Amir. So. Okay, that's great. <laughs> uh, just I'll give you a little bit of background about what we have been doing on the Fraternal Society's collection and then what we are up to at the moment. Um, as, as some of you might know, uh, we have the university have been involved uh, in uh, getting a donation um, of objects who are belonging to uh, Fraternal Societies in the region and some beyond the region uh, since 2015. In the last few years, uh, the special collection team were working on uh, rehousing, documenting, digitizing the items. And now we are at the stage of uh, promotion and curation. And in this stage, initially we had the plan of having an exhibition, but by the end of the year about the objects that we uh, have worked on, but given the restrictions and conditions that are not uh, so much stable at the moment, we have decided to go uh, digital and have our uh, exhibition delivered digitally. As part of this, uh, and I will let everyone know about uh, how it is like about the dates and everything uh, as we get closer to the event. We are going to have about uh, three to four talks by the academics um, about different angles of fraternals and, and or use of objects. And also we have the exhibit of some select objects and stories around that. So the, the one part of it is that we are trying to develop the stories related to the city. And one, one thing that came across recently was a story of an old lady uh, who used to make the regalia for the Masonic lodges. Um, I, I try to develop, I'm trying to develop uh, the story around her, but I think in this, I need all of you guys help if you're interested to just give a context to what, what's been happening. Um, I share my, uh, I share my screen so you see the names that I'm searching at the moment. Um, okay, uh, so just first of all, yeah. So uh, as you can see, uh, 
we are trying to uh, find out about some people who were important in the region, particularly the one that I have bolded are the locals um, who have been involved in uh, fraternal societies as uh, people who made um, regalia and, and all those stuff. Mrs. A.S. Thompson. Uh, when you search her on, on the trove, there is a little bit of a story, but we don't have any first name of her, what happened later to her, and, and where was the business exactly? One part says Cessnock, the other part says somewhere in Mayfield. And, and then uh, with that name comes the name Gilbert Horler, uh, who happens to be a to be the uncle of Mrs. Thompson and a Mason himself. Again, we don't know much about him. We don't have his image, anything like that. So this is, I think, something that everybody who is interested can help with. Uh, if you come across of any photo of these people, or if you happen to know more about uh, this, uh, these people, uh, I would greatly appreciate. Hello. I think we've lost Amir. <laughs> I was going to ask Amir, when were they making the regalia? Um, I don't know. Because the Lost Newcastle Facebook group would probably, they'd probably be a good community to, to call, to, to yeah. sort of ask. Now, I know His Bourne, connection I seems to... Yeah. yeah, Bob. Oh, sorry, Marla. Oh, I was I was just going to say, um, and I believe the Trove article was from the early nineteen fifties, around nineteen fifty two, with Mrs. Thompson, yeah. and she looked to be in around her sixties um, yeah. at that stage. No, that's interesting. So there uh, might be, yeah, her children or family members still around. Yeah. So, so Bob, so I mean Bob James, Dr. Bob James, you're here. Uh, do, you, do you know anything about those particular individuals and is chasing? Bob, you might just have to unmute. Yeah, that's it. Hello. Hello. I'm now. Uh, yep. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, I just uh, picked up. So basically, uh, if anyone can help with the name of the people and everything, uh, I would appreciate any help. We know some of the other names that I have shared and I shared it uh, in the chat box were influential people politically. Like, uh, for example, I have discovered about um, WPJ Skelton, who, uh, who apparently was a, a MP at some point, but but any other names that I I share with you, if you give me if you could give me some information, would be very useful. Um, so yeah, I, I share it in the chat box. So just for everyone to know about the names, and yeah. Uh, and yeah, just email me or email John or contact us anyway, uh, and, and then yeah, we can get it done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Amir. I think the um, the mystery sound is coming from you, Bob. It is, and I'm, I don't want to mute Bob because <laughs> I think he was going to okay. talk. <laughs> it sounds like a, you've got a bunch of frogs down there. Uh, uh, whoop, whoop. I, I don't know what to do. Okay. I, you can't hear me at all, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah we can, can hear you. Now, yeah. yeah, you've just got a little chorus oh, of frogs okay. behind you. I don't know what, what it is. There might be a, a, oh, a, a connection issue. Directly. Yeah, 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 probably yeah. my computer directly. Yeah, probably my computer. We can hear you. It's just, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that, Amir. I haven't, I haven't uh, known what was happening. Um, so your update is been very useful to me. But where did you get that list from? I, I thought I sent you information about Skelton, for example, but um, perhaps I haven't. 
No, Bob. The only thing that we have is a photo that pe these people are s sitting together, and it belongs to a photo in 1950s uh, that apparently they were on the uh, orange lodge. And particularly my focus at this stage is on the oranges. And the reason for that is uh, that um, because of their great influence on the social changes and political changes in early, late 19th, early 20th century. Um, and, and, and many of the people who we happen to have as influential used to be uh, one way or another oranges uh, or against oranges at some point. So yeah, I don't have I don't have information much, but what I have is the photo, and also because because the photo doesn't give that is it from left to right or left or right to left, I don't know which one of the guys is exactly uh, this uh, W. The PJ skeleton, for example. So that's why I'm asking for everyone's help. Uh, so to, to, to add to re local relevance of the collection. So we, we, yeah. I, I, we are tending to have this story uh, in the context of early 20th century Newcastle and Australia. Amir, in in my book, um, they call each other brother, which you have copies of. There are two or three pages about Skelton, um, okay. and a number of his uh, certificates are in the collection, um, which your people have been working on. Mm -hmm. And um, the Skelton was an MP for Newcastle. He worked on the railways during the First World War. Um, he was very strongly loyal orange and uh, a trade unionist and he was the member for newcastle in the 1920s but he started his own political party mm. uh, the protestant labor party and he represented that in newcastle for some years but he also started his own loyal orange association so he's a particularly interesting person from the point of view of fraternal studies but I ask again, uh, where did you get that list of names from? Uh, this is in the photo. Oh, I see. I, I haven't seen that photo. I don't know anything about that, that photo. Um, perhaps you could send that to me. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll send it. Uh, but at the moment, my focus, is, I mean, the focus at the moment is mostly on Mrs. Thompson and his uh, and her uncle because their story is very much about like uh, people people who were living as uh, like what to say um, working class people so it, it 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 is very much relevant to the everyday life of any any person in newcastle uh, thank you um, please mention adela sylvia thompson I'll search that out. But yeah, if, 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 if anyone happens to have an image of the Horler's uh, workshop or their, uh, or their, like their pictures, it would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, well, uh, while you were offline, Amir, I think Anne suggested that you might want to um, have a post on Lost Newcastle as well. There might be relatives of a yeah, sure. Sure. Thompson. Sure. So, yeah, so, Bob, um, you might need to exchange a bit of information so, or, or maybe, Amir, if you could send a copy of the photo to okay. Bob um, and then just start to build build the info. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, no thank you. So, Bob, if I can get you to mute. Um, That's it. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. So now um, we've got uh, room for some updates from the other historical groups. If any want to to give updates on what their organisations have been doing. Ron, you're muted, though, Ron. Ron Barber. 
unmuted. Yep, you're yep. unmuted now. Yep. Uh, uh, we're uh, having a meeting of volunteers on Wednesday to work out uh, and go through the procedures and so on that are going to be necessary to open, uh, reopen the port. Oh, sorry, Ron, just, is... uh, just let everyone know where you're from because there might oh, be people who don't know. Yep. Uh, we're having a meeting on Wednesday with all the, well, last count of 50 out of the volunteers in various groups um, to uh, work out what requirements, how to meet the requirements with that, that situation. And um, the plan is to reopen on the 18th. Uh, one thing that is certain, the tunnel tour groups will only be six persons with the four square metre rule. But again, the, the bookings for those will be online through the museum. That's, all, that's where we're at at present. Thanks, Johnny. Okay, thank you, Ron. Howard? Just to follow on from your comments earlier, Johnny, uh, one other further step in terms of, uh, we have submitted two papers to the International Conference of Southern Hemisphere Meteorological and Oceanographic Congress in Christchurch. Both uh, abstracts have gone in. I've received a message for them saying that they have been overwhelmed with abstracts and therefore we will not know at, until after the original date that they originally set. But it looks like it's gonna be a very popular conference. I've been to a couple of those before in the past, one in Chile uh, and one in South Africa. Uh, and if possible, I do hope I'm going to go to Christchurch because it should be a very interesting process. And there'll be a special section on historical weather data sets and historical weather research at that conference. That's great, Howard, thank you. Um, any other updates? Please just shout out if I, if I can't see your hand. Are uh, there you go, Robert, over to you. eating a piece of cake, but there's no surprise there. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. And, um, and I want to show you this, that on, uh, so everyone can see that, just nod. Okay, so on Facebook, a guy down in Melbourne, uh, an associate professor called Leon Bren, um, went and bought a box full of glass negatives because um, he has a bit of an interest in photography. And, and he put this up on Lost Newcastle and that one on Lost Newcastle and that one on Lost Newcastle, um, along with a few others. And so people jumped in uh, to say, well, we know where these things are so they're glass negatives I think he said that they're five inches by seven inches and so I contacted him directly and and said look at some point uh you might want to donate these to a university archive um and he said uh, yes he got no problem with that because he bought them sight unseen and he has no connection with Newcastle at all um so so I established that contact with him and then uh, when you download photos off Facebook, it comes down in poor in poor resolution, but um, but that's that's the one which uh, got my eye because that's taken from the obelisk looking over Derby Street, and there's the the coal trucks lined up for the sea pit, I think it is, and this is St John's Church here, and overlooking. Uh, towards Adamstown and Merriweather. And the reason why that took my eye is because that's similar to a triplet of photos that uh, Ralph Snowball took. So I have appended that to the left-hand end. So we have these three Snowball pictures here, and now we've got the extra bit here on the end, which I think is um, a mixture of being a fluke and, uh, and really good. And obviously in those days, uh, the obelisk uh, was totally bare of trees. So going up there and taking a, a um, uh, photos was obviously the thing to do. And the, um, 
I know this is going to sound like a bit of silliness, but way, way down uh, over, if I can zoom in, way down here, there's cattle that are in this paddock here. And, um, uh, and the cattle were almost in the same position. But I guess if you've got a paddock that's only got three cows in it, they're, they're going to line up anyhow. But um, all of this rubble in the foreground all lined up uh, and going uh, further into the distance, the the um, I think that's the bowl, the Lowlands Bowling Club, and all of those buildings were um, still in the, in the two photos. So we know that they're all dated to 1906, which is pretty good. The other thing he, that he said to me was, um, he said, oh, he said you might be interested in the other thing that I that I've got is um, I've got a camera that was uh, made out of red cedar and it was made in Newcastle. And I thought, all oh, right. Um, and he said that it's about the size of an esky. Uh, so it's quite big. He said, it's obviously it's a studio one. And, um, and he said, you might be interested in this. He said, it was made by a guy called Fred Barry. And if you have a look on Hidden Hamilton and a lady called Ruth Cotton, she's written up all about uh, Fred Barry because he used to make all sorts of things out of, uh, out of red cedar. Um, so, uh, so I've got to go back to him, Johnny, you'll appreciate this. I'll go back to him and I'll say to him, make sure you put a sticker, uh, send us a photo of it, but put a sticker in it that, that in the event that you pass, that someone from your family sends the, the camera up to Newcastle uh, because we'd like to see it. Oh, Robert, you're getting me in trouble. But look, <laughs> you've, you've, uh, you've discovered, I think, the missing piece that, that um, Russell Rigby was trying to locate. Oh, of those glass negatives. The three of those glass negatives are in our, um, in yes. our collection. Yes. And he was trying to track down the fourth bit and had written to Newcastle, who I think had the glass neg, but couldn't find it. So right. I just want, this is why the question I'm asking is how where, these glass negs, I know Snowball took two versions of each of his shots. So where you've got the cows down there, then there could have been one with slightly different cows because he would take two shots just to be sure so maybe yes. one of the negs has ended up somewhere else but right um yeah russell would love to have seen <laughs> that so it's just great that you've been able to find these yeah. missing panoramas you know the missing yeah. bits out of these panoramas so yeah and but where they, these neg i mean these negatives are just driving me nuts as to where they ended up because um i'm still accounting for the eight thousand that Bert Lovett and uh, Norm Barney rediscovered in, in Snowball's original house. Yes. Now, we know they trashed around 2,000 of them. Um, 1,000 came to us. 1,000 went to Keith Parsons, um, and it's in his house somewhere, but he can't find them, um, which leaves 4,000 that are supposedly in, um, in town. So it's an interesting, it's been dispersed. Um, so it's interesting to see, but this is, the glass negs are something... These are glass negs, so you know yes. you don't. Uh, with copies, you could have copies floating around, but with glass negs, you just wonder why why they're they've yeah. escaped out of the coop, if you know yeah. what I mean. And so. and uh, and he said that he just saw an ad on eBay that said a uh, bunch of glass negatives, and uh, he was the only bidder. He said, "I think oh, I paid God. less than fifty dollars." And he said, oh. "He said I just looked through them, and he said I didn't know anything." And then my he said my Wife said, I think that picture is Newcastle Beach. Mm. Um, and uh, Oh, well, good on you for, for checking yeah. it up. That's well, great. Well, so he joined Lost Newcastle and put, yep. posted up to say, does this mean anything to anyone? So, yep. um, anyway, so, so I was pretty excited about well, that. And, uh, and if we can get a, a, a Fred Barry handmade camera. Yes, that's amazing. Uh, yeah. That really is amazing. Jenny and okay. Robert, I know on the local the uh, Lost Newcastle post, some of the other slides contained images of what looked to be sort of family photographs. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be interesting to know if um, I guess any of those people might be recognisable from the other snowball photographs. Yeah. It could be. And um, uh, that one that I had before with the, the boat, that one there, um, see the boat shed in the background, it's got vertical sides. Yep. and a single uh, bar across it. So in in the um, special collections, there's a postcard of boat sheds on Cockle Creek, 
with that exact same design, but I wow. can't see the exact same tree. But no. but we you know we're but we're pretty close. And um, so uh, yes, you're right, Marla. There we might be able to track down uh, some of these other things. I'm even yeah. looking at the pavers and the lattice in that garden <laughs> shop, thinking, do they look like the ones that I? <laughs> Yeah, oh, yes. isn't it? Isn't it fun? These ancient photographs, and especially when you get ones that are in your backyard, it's just great. Sort of trying to piece them all together. Yep. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's yeah, all. That's I'll great, Robert. Great okay. stuff. All right. Well, that's that's really exciting. Good. Yep. Good. Love those things when people find unknown, hidden bits of other things. You know, it's just quite exciting. All right. So shout out if you if you want to jump in at any point before we open up discussions in other areas anyone want to provide Gianni, any can updates I, to, yeah can yep. i just um introduce yep. so so matters to everybody yep. um yeah i'm not sure whether <laughs> yeah i put on the the agenda i sent out last week but um zo is one of our colleagues at the library she's a research librarian um uh, so works with jenny schoolander who presented last meeting um, I said to Zoe and Jenny that we'll sort of keep on the agenda if any anyone's got any questions around research or, you know, um, sort of finding things on the library catalogue that um, we can refer any questions back on to Zoe. But I'm not sure if anyone has sort of got any any questions they want to ask so so now um, that they might have in, in sort of searching our catalogue or anything they're stuck with in finding. Any questions? All right. But so thanks for. Uh, I've got, I've, I, sorry, I've got a question. Um, yep, go ahead. That, that that link that you gave for the, the new library catalogue. When you go to it, oh, does it say lib apps? Does it? No, it says don't go this way. It's dangerous. It's it'll take your world away from you, <laughs> Marla. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's, uh, I don't know. Is it the server? Is it the server you're using that it's not? It is, it's just oh, the browser, you mean? The browser, sorry. Oh, yeah, well, I could, do remember there be. was an issue with the link when it was originally provided by David Coop. So yeah. we might just need to make sure mm. that it's. Oh, the, that's right. Yeah, I'm getting the same message. Yeah, yeah this yeah, connection is not private. A different link that we can send. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So I'll send that after the meeting. Good on you, Kim. Oh, that's right. I think that. that. Oh, good on you. Good on you for clicking on the links. That was just a tester to see who was asleep and who was awake. So you get the award. You get a special packet of chips. We'll be sent out to your address. <laughs> yeah, I've had, we've had those problems with our own sites from time to time, and it's an issue with the service certificates, I think. So that's good. Any other updates? Questions? All right, looks like everyone's pretty happy. Well, look, the last thing we wanted to discuss was just the nature of the Monday afternoon meetings, I guess, and if it's still, uh, if people feel this is best for them. I mean, the the setting for these meetings was originally um, set by Dr. Eric Eklund, who um, created the group back in 2003 as the Coal River Working Party. So he was an academic. So I, I assumed he was picking times that suited his um, his uh, availability, but you know we've been meeting for I think what almost twenty years now. So um, it'd be good to revisit and see what suits people better, um, and just open it up for discussion. Um, if there are better times, especially from the academics and the students, if they want us to think about that or how people feel about the way the meetings are now. I feel that Zoom meetings open things up a bit more, but we haven't probably been um, letting enough people know about coming in through Zoom because the limitations of uh, time and place aren't really there when you're meeting over online. Um, so that should be an advantage. Um, but there are people that do prefer to meet um, in a physical space. And when things do start to open up, there might be a chance that we might be able to do a bit of both. So we might be able to have physical meetings, but also have a contingent who meet online. But I just thought I'd open it up 
for a discussion. Uh, Anne's provided some questions there um, to think yeah, about. I'm I'm just about to put them in the chat. Um, okay. Yeah, and, and see what I can do is also email them around. So um, you sort of think of things afterwards, but sort of basically, yeah, yeah looking at the format. And um, so I'll just, I've just put that in the chat now. Um, yeah, just re regarding like the format, whether people are sort of, happy with zoom or i know um there's people that haven't been able to attend because they're um yeah they don't have the technology or computers to attend via zoom um and if, yeah, they, basically, if, yeah. if, if they if anyone is ha having any troubles just let them know that um well, well, Robert, I hope you don't mind me saying that Robert's been a great help at getting people on. Zoom's a very flexible medium that works with old technologies as well. So if you um, if you run, I mean, I'm running it on some of the old iPads here and it still works okay. So it's really good with backwards compatibility. Um, you might not get all the bells and whistles like the free cat masks and the hats and the mustaches but or, or the pink lipstick but um it it will work at getting you into the meeting so if you need any help um in getting online then uh, we can we can um just let us know or let us know if there's someone that you know that's trying to get online but can't and we'll see if we can um we can help them yeah definitely for me the uh the huge benefit is uh, when someone remotely does a presentation because you can see it all on your computer screen or your, your, your tablet and it's very, very clear. And uh, yeah. so I, I, if we do go back to actual physical meetings, I'd probably say, can we have every third meeting as a Zoom meeting if there's a good presentation with lots of photos? Yes, well, until Tim jumped into the presentations, mate, I had three uh, presenters um, from uh, Stroud Historical Society, I, I put it on them over the weekend to try and get something together. And if they did, um, they could present and they were just about to do it. And then they got cold feet. And then one of them ran into a deer. So on the road, so I'm hoping that she'll, she's okay. Um, but um, the other one was Ed Togs. I'm not sure if Ed has joined us today. Ed, are you out there somewhere or not? I don't think he has. Journey, no. Okay. Well, I opened it up for Ed as well, if he could make it. Um, but yeah, it's it's pretty good, no matter where where you are, um, to access um, the Zoom meetings. But I know that Zoom is not the cup of tea for everybody. Uh, and then when you do run hybrid meetings, you've really got to be careful that you don't um, that the Zoom people don't become second class citizens at the meeting. So I've been on the receiving end of, a, of being a Zoomer into a physical hybrid meeting and you feel very isolated because no one, the attention all goes on to the people in the room rather than the people through Zoom. So, mm. uh, but, you know, given the, give, yeah, given distance and availability to travel and trying to find car parks, I think it's a lot easier um, doing it over Zoom. But your thoughts, if just throw in your ideas if you want for now um, and look at the questions. So uh, the questions that Anne's posed is regarding the meeting format. What do you think works well? What do you think doesn't work so well? Um, what's the most useful thing about attending the meetings? Uh, what other subjects would you like us to cover uh, from our presenters? Um, do you prefer the physical or the Zoom? Um, and would you prefer another day or time of the week? So they're the sorts of starting off questions. So just have a think about it. If anything comes to mind now, throw it in. If not, um, send it to us through an email at some point. Yeah, so I'm also going to put the same questions to some of our academics. And I know there's quite a few on our mailing list and they can't always attend on a Monday. So it'll be interesting to get their feedback as well. Um, a Zoom meeting might actually suit some of the academics and um, students um, that might just want to sort of Zoom in for a presentation or something like that. Now, I know Dr Chip Garrett's with us. It'd be interesting just to get um, Chip's feedback. I don't know. Are you still on the session, Chip? Yeah, I apologize for not having the video on, but the entire household is on Zoom at the moment. Oh. So I've got a, I've got a first year uni student, I've got a high school student and a, and a pro vice chancellor upstairs. So oh. it's, a, 
it's pretty packed. That's a fool's um, ass. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> the um, for me the um, uh, I think it's it's convenient to be on Zoom. Um, I I do enjoy when um, like for example when we went into the digital collection um, in Newcastle. So doing a site visit. So for example, if if Kerry was going to take us around and show us, you know, how um, you know a physical space that's then been digitized, um, something like that's really useful because you know you get to see both sides of it. Um, but in terms of just convenience, um, I know this is so, this sounds horrible because I spend my life on Zoom, but um, it's it is pretty easy when you don't have to fight for a car park or you know um, worry about being in a physical space. Um, it, it's a little bit easier sometimes just to sort of be able to slide into a Zoom. Um, yeah, especially if you can't make the whole thing, but you can get in for one bit of it. Um, it's, it, I think that makes it a little bit more convenient. But um, yeah, no, I mean, I certainly miss seeing people in, in person and the sort of, you know, conviviality. And remember when we were allowed to eat and drink and things like that? That was, yeah. that was nice. <laughs> but um, uh, it's, yeah, but fitting it in around, um, um, you know, lectures and, um, and other things like that uh, makes it a little bit easier to do on Zoom. Um, if not for all the time, then at least maybe um, every so often. So that way, um, um, you know, people that um, are super keen to be in person um, are catered for. And then um, for other people, um, they can catch up. Johnny's point about trying to do the hybrid model is totally true because I've had to teach that way and it's a nightmare. So trying to make sure that you're neither neglecting the people in the room or the people online is, um, is a very difficult balancing act. Mm. Thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. No yeah, I was just thinking it might be interesting to have, um, you know, be very flexible about those alternate meetings, especially, or maybe have ones that are tailor made, especially if we have things coming out of the main meetings that really uh, would be interesting to get academic and student involvement on. Because I know that the city of Newcastle as part of the Green Bands was asking about a student that could possibly help write the copy um, for the exhibition and things like that. So it would be great to be able to have some presentations that are directly targeted at, um, at um, students, at maybe communications and things like that, um, to see if anyone would be interested in working on a real world um, uh, project as part of their work integrated learning or something like that. Yeah. Any other views or opinions or? Well, I, I like the Zoom and, I, and particularly with you there, I mean, you're as clear and, and wonderful. But a lot of us don't have that um, uh, machinery in their house to to make a clear <laughs> picture or yeah. have a I mean I've got a, a thing here I suppose you, you know it's well, just a I'll, I'll tell you that, Doug. That, that there should what we need though is some physical meetings but yeah. not 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 have a lot of them because yeah. I think these are really really good it's like when Tim Tim was showing the on earth road he was able to throw up yeah uh, very clear pictures. And I understand Chip's point that if we go into town, for instance, when we did the session at the digital library, it was yeah. just fantastic having access to that large screen. So we could show you some of the things that we'd put up, you know, in terms of high resolution and really see how high that resolution was when you've got a TV set that's the size of a wall, you know. Um, so things like that. If we've got something that we can really razzle dazzle physically, um, that would be great to have the physical meeting with. Um, but apart from that, if we're showing you things that, that are online, there's no reason why Zoom can't do it. But the other thing, Doug, I was going to mention is Fred Barry's um, camera that Robert was talking about. Uh, while I was doing the presentation on the dating historical photographs, I came across this young guy that had reconstructed his own uh, glass plate camera. And he said the resolution of that contraption is huge in comparison to any digital camera you might want to oh. think about today. So even though it's made out of red cedar, the resolution of the amount of information that that red box will capture will probably dwarf anything that, that you've seen from the, in the technological 
world. And uh, it was quite amazing to think that he could just construct this thing out of wood. And, um, you know, when it gets down to it, the amount of blight that it captures is uh, is really the key. And that so. is amazing, Johnny. But, you know, if you look at the uh, those uh, snowball prints that we put up in the number one gun pit in Fort Scratchley, they're eight foot by four foot and they are just, you know, there's minute detail in them. Like, one yeah. where they're, they're all parading above the nine-inch RML gun, you can see where Hugh Holt couldn't stand Look. to get stand still long enough that his his face is actually blurred where he moved. Okay, Ron. <laughs> Look, you've just you've just. I was going to keep this quiet. No, we'll not keep it quiet. It's out there, but uh, they're still tweaking it. But um, do you know that? the New South Wales, I mean, they've got this particular, they're mapping historical photographs uh, at the moment. Um, and just let me get into my, I need to get the, um, the links, but they've mapped all the historical photographs for Newcastle um, for 1944. They haven't officially released it yet, but it's up online. And um, I've created a blog post for them, but they're currently tweaking at the moment, just trying to fix up some of the, the um, dark spots. It's really just cosmetic work that they're doing um, at the moment. But just let me grab, the, grab my draft um, and I'll... Bear with me, bear with me, bear with me. I won't, pu I won't press the publish button. <laughs> um, okay, let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, might be that one. Okay. So this is the post that I'm working in, but this was the um, this is the site. So this is this this is. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Yep. Okay, so this is the extent of the aerial imagery that they've mapped for Newcastle. This is the most comprehensive they've done to date. And it's all it was all taken during World War II um, from a plane, 1944, and this is the site. Um, and that's the one of the screenshots that I that I grabbed, which was Fort Scratchley from the air on for you um, in 1944. Oh, yeah, that, that's uh... That's after after June. Yeah, that's all the camouflage where, okay. where it was made into buildings. Okay, okay, okay. So that's camouflage, is it? Yeah. Ah. See the the observation post. Yeah. If you go back to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can see where it's standing out. It yeah. was designed to look like a three story house. Okay. So because you mentioned that in the film that people are yet to see. Yeah, the guns okay. are covered by uh, camouflage and. Oh. and in one of the gun pits, there's still the rail where they used to roll around. Okay. Well, look, these are uh, these images are absolute, absolutely magic, and I've just got directions on there on how to use it. Now, uh, it's on the new photo exam. Let's see if it works. Um, all right. So this is that's Spacious the site there, history. and this is the history historical imagery site which we're going to now. Uh, just let it load. <clears throat> okay. So let me see. Once I click the Oh, sorry. Hang on while I try and negotiate my screen on Zoom and see everything. Okay, that's the splash screen. I've got to select the imagery. Remove the historic. Okay, so that's the layer there. Um, and then you zoom in on it. So it's currently online and the closer you get. So this is, these are all the little black sections they're currently working on removing. So very soon they're going to be launching this, but it's just, uh, they're very excited about it um, because this is something that, you know, we've really wanted to be able to do is grab the aerial photography. I don't, um, I don't think there's, I haven't seen, ever seen a, an aerial photograph like that of, uh, Camp Shortland and uh, no, well you yeah, well it goes right out to the suburbs. I found my house in there, so it's it's pretty substantial and it's um it's quite wonderful. And see, this is the sort of yeah. um, wonderful layering that we want to be able to try and do, especially in attaching 
historical records to the landscape of the period they were created in, you know. Um, so at the moment, the reason why we got to know about this, I've seen this site before and I've tried to access other material more recently, but this is the most comprehensive outside of Sydney that they've done since. So once they launch it, I think it's going to be pretty big news. That's the cathedral site with the graveyard um, behind it. Um, the reason why they contacted us is because we had all the Milton Kent um, airplane photographs that were taken in Newcastle between 1926, 27. We reckon it's around 28 because it finally hits um, the newspapers in 1929. Um, but when we had the images up, again, Greg and Sylvia Ray helped digitise the high resolution images that um, were were now who, who found them for us oh god it's up in that, that blog post as well um but they're quite uh, extraordinary images i'll see if i can find those for you um so these are the milton kent these were we put these up online back in 2014 we took a couple of goes at them because the first time we saw them, we had all this misleading information about them coming from 1935. And then once I kept uh, asking the fellow that had dug them up for more information, we real and put them up online, people start to recognize the, the scenes in the building. So they were very interested in this shot here. All right. As you can see, this is the detail. So I think they've got, they're trying to see if they can get earlier imagery because I think a lot of the, um, aerials date from about the 1920s when planes started being able to fly in straight lines and carry cameras so um but that's the newcastle landscape and if they can start mapping some of these photographs as well that'll be that'll be fantastic um but so these are quite extraordinary images that um milton kent took of the newcastle cbd and as you can see there's a tram traveling down there and um, really extraordinary stuff. And there's the, another view of the graveyard at the time. And um, God knows, look at that. That's, is that under construction or has it been blown up? Oh, I can't tell. Um, but that's the cathedral. Or were they doing, I think they were building the steep, uh, the, the tower, weren't they? I think they were, yeah. Okay, I think there was some okay. addition. God, yeah, look at the mess. The yeah. Look at the mess around yeah. it. So. Yes. It's uh, quite a quite amazing set of um, of images. So you know, um, but anyway, there's um, there's knobbies from the entrance there as well. So so yes, um, it's uh, quite. So watch out for that one. Um, I've invited them, uh, the people that are putting that up, to come and talk to us um, about it. Um, but yeah, it's quite quite extraordinary stuff, and it's quite expansive. So that's all 1944, basically that they will soon release on that site. But have a look; there's plenty of other material there, especially where, from the 1990s. Where can we see it? It's on the um, Transport New South Wales site. I can send you. I can put a link. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. The, incidentally, uh, you were talking about cast nets uh, earlier. Did yeah. Is, and, Anyone got a copy of the uh, the mural that used to be there on the at the back where the cast nets used to play? Um, do you know? I, I've I've got a. I don't know whether it was taken by accident or, or not, but the mural was on the Frederick Ash building, and they knocked down the Frederick Ash building, as you know. Ah, oh, uh, the mural I, went with it. It might be in the museum. I don't know because it's part of an exhibition that. At the minute we went into lockdown, that was when they were going to open it. So. Um, if we do get a chance to get in there, get in there. But I've got the date now um, of when it will be launched. It'll either be the 21st or the 22nd of October this month. Right. All right. right. So stay tuned uh, for that. But it's a great film. It really is. It uh, just puts a big smile on your, on your face. <laughs> yeah. And they're very funny people um, as to what the shenanigans of what they used to get up to <laughs> at that venue. Um, but, yes, uh, a shortened version of it has is playing in the Newcastle Museum. And I think the launch, if it's on the 21st or 22nd, uh, if there's going to be a, a like a, a physical launch, we'll hope, hope probably be there. So keep an eye out for any 
any announcements, but they've done such such a great a great lot of work. The two films yet to come are one on Nobbies itself, um, which will be um, which, which which I think has to happen, and the other one will be on uh, Bura Ben and uh, Threlkeld's language work. So there's some other ones that they've got in the like they've got a certain way through because COVID's been working havoc on them, but there's one on, on, on Newcastle's car culture, um, which is also there. And there was another one that they were going to, they, they were working on, on the Carrington pump house. So there's quite a lot of films that these guys have been able to, to create for us during this project. Uh, and COVID's has created quite a havoc around them, but with really, it's been incredible the amount of content they've been able to get out. Do, do you have contact with Sarah Cameron? Uh, I, mean, she, I know she's... Oh, uh, I haven't. I think she's still on social media. Man, did you want yeah, to jump in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I'm in contact with her, and I think she still gets these minutes. Um, she's got the okay. same email, but she's down in Sydney. I oh, like she's here, but working, um, managing the heritage site of... Um, Roselle. Roselle, yeah. And, and, and you know, and she was the heritage officer in Newcastle, and is very, very knowledgeable person. Yeah, yeah, she is. Um, talking about the Castanet Club before, I'm thinking that probably deserves a blue plaque. Yes, I'd say so too. So yeah, that's um, someone wants to put one in. <laughs> Which building? Oh yes, we'd put it on the Clarendon out the front or out the back, maybe. Where the um, blast furnace or the the Castanet Club used to be. Danny, can yes. I um, just uh, have a word? Yes, John Pryor. Uh, yep, um, John. You're talking about the ten by eight glass plate negatives, and uh, since this was the subject, I used to lecture at uni on photogrammetry and photography. Yep. I've just done a calculation on the back of an envelope here for you. <laughs> <laughs> Typically, when you're uh, rescanning digital imagery, you use about a 10 micron resolution. Um, anything smaller than that, you just sort of get into the grain of the film, but you could usually use 10 micron. And on a typical 10 by eight glass plate photograph, that's the equivalent of a 500 megapixel camera. And, you know, the one in your phone is probably 10 megapixels these days. And wow. remember, uh, 10 years ago, everybody was goo about having a one megapixel camera. So those old glass plates um, from 100 years ago are the equivalent of a 500 megapixel. If you wanted to stretch it and pull it back to about seven micron resolution, you will get a thousand megapixel camera. So uh, there's nothing wrong with the old technology. No, no, <laughs> it's, it's quite amazing, isn't it? And that was brought, I mean, even the photographers at the time we were trying to get to high resolution imagery of the Pender plans, that's what they were saying. There's no way digital can catch up with some of the, the old physical formats. <laughs> so and the other the other thing is that um, whilst there's this new historical, new inverted commas historical photography of Newcastle, for some time now, perhaps at least a decade, there's been the 1943 photography all over Sydney. That yep. was taken by the old department of main roads. Actually, one of my, uh, uh, a colleague that I went through university with, he worked there and uh, worked in the photography section. He pieced them all together. So there is a, uh, a, a rather complete coverage of all of Sydney. And um, when we were doing some family history things, it was really good to go back and find which houses were where and where they weren't. And, before yep. all the roads went in and all the western suburbs were developed. Yeah. And so that's also available and it's got a very nice method of getting in and out a question and, you know, you can put in Seven Hills or Toon Gabby and you'll come up with the relevant photo and you can get the ones adjacent and they've bridged them all together. Yeah, it's so fantastic. It's really good stuff for if you're so, investigating Sydney. So, John, the earliest aerial photography is the 1920s, is that right? That's right. Uh, well, they, uh, the earliest aerial photography, if we want to go, that was the American Civil War. It was okay. in the 1860s, but it was out of, uh, out of balloons. The, areas, the first ever aerial photographer was taken in Paris in 1856. 
Oh. Um, and uh, that was very, that was out of a hot air balloon. And uh, the poor chap had a, had a great difficulty um, because uh, weight was a big problem to get enough hot air to get the balloon up. And so being a typical Frenchman, he went up naked um, <laughs> to save weight. However, he did put on his elbows and knees a sponge with, it was wet because occasionally the sparks from the fire that he had to have in the basket would go up and hit the silk in the balloon part at the top. And he had to climb up the ropes and douse it out with his elbow or his knee in, in case he went down in flames. So there's a series of photographs of the Arc de Triomphe. He took um, he had a glass plate film a camera and he had a, a slide moved across it. And so his 10 by eight film he cut up into four across the top and four across the bottom. So he sort of um, uh, duffed out seven eighths of it and just exposed it eight times. And so he got eight photos from different directions. Um, from there, they went to World War, uh, sorry, they went to the American Civil War where they took photos from hot air balloons of the defense lines of the opposition. They would fly the balloon up over the opposition lines. From there, you went to Prior to World War I, they were taking photographs from kites. And to get a constant flow, the kite was flown off the deck of a ship. And the photographers, they were taking photos, the English were taking photographs of the French coastline, and the French were taking photographs of the Germans, and the Germans were photographing the English, all from kites being dragged around by boats in the channel. Uh, and then the first aeroplanes that they used were really about 1915 in World War I, where, and from there, it just went crazy, of course. Anyway, sorry for the history lesson. That's but, a uh, fantastic. Uh, well, John, the reason why I ask is because those wonderful engravings that, I mean, were published in the Illustrated Sydney News, um, people wonder how they, they were taken, and one of the suggestions was that they were done from hot air balloons because the 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 aspect that you're seeing is from the air somewhere but i mean these photographs i guess are from about 1865 there's ones of maitland the detail is extraordinary so it sort of fits that it could have been done if they'd taken a an image like a glass plate negative from a balloon that well, could work certainly 1856 is that the, those you can find them quite readily okay. there in Paris. And, and from there, certainly in 1860, yep. they were in the American Civil War. Yeah. What When they first took uh, aerial ones in uh, Australia, I'm not certain, but I have seen a glass plate uh, negatives from Australia. The earliest was uh, that I've seen is 1853, 1854. So we certainly had... Uh, cameras out here then because John, Sir Thomas Mitchell was taken on one and he died in 1855. Oh, wow. John, have you ever written this up anywhere? Uh, uh, it was in no. all my lecture notes. <laughs> that I used to talk, <laughs> tell the students about it in the uh, try and get them interested in the first uh, lecture before we go. Oh, well, you might want to you might want to compose a blog post for us perhaps. <laughs> yeah, I'll just find my old notes. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so we've got about six minutes left. Anyone burning can, to say something? Oh, can, Joni, can I just, I've just noticed Louise Gale has put something in the chat that I thought I'd point out. Um, I know Amir's still with us. So Louise's fantastic family history skills. She's found for us confirming A.S. Thompson was um, Adelia Sylvia Magna, born D, who married James Hutchinson Thompson in 1908. Adelia was related to Gilbert Haller through his wife, Mary. So, Amir, there's a little bit of information. I've learned so much at this meeting already. Yes, Thompson. <laughs> Thank you, Louise. <laughs> Thank you, it's Louise. Fabulous. I just mentioned, uh, I'd like to mention that Rob Winston, are you there? Am I yep. on? Yep, you, I can hear you, Rob, Doug. Sorry, Rob, I was just. Rob, do you, did you know Rob Winston? Yes. He was a planner at Newcastle yep. and he was a, a cartographer with the, um, with the Northumberland County Council. 
before it was abandoned in, in 1964, and and later with uh, uh, the uh, uh, the the body that took over from them, the 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 state planning authority. Now he had a big camera set up. Uh, and he was able to piece together a lot of the aerial photographs and he was doing that. And his um, um, archive should be with the new, with the Newcastle uh, li Library. Okay. okay. I think that's, of course, he, he put all the uh, original plans from the 52 uh, planning um, exhibition, the, the Northumberland County Council with the... Uh, Boulevard scheme and so on, but we we he was on our committee with the setting up the Hunter two thousand document for the National Trust in nineteen, which we published in nineteen seventy four, and um, he very 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 uh, useful. He, but he was able to piece these together because you're dealing with uh, taking pictures of of something that's round, which is the uh, Earth. Uh, it's a globe, and uh, to get it onto a flat uh, requires lots of little uh, readjustments. Re yeah, yeah, we found that with some of that work. Um, the centre of the image was the most accurate yes. uh, bit. Yeah, but yes. it's great. It's great work. I mean, because it's uh, it's just fantastic to be able to create yeah. these layers. Yeah, but anyway, so Rob Winston's work is really. Uh, he, he, he used to lecture at the uni too in cartography. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, any other takers for? Yes. Yes, Bob. We have a number of Bobs. So, Bob, uh, you will have to unmute yourself again. Sorry, Bob. There you go. Well, uh, okay. Well, that, that's that's the question I was about to ask, John. Um, being a troglodyte, I don't know even how this current technology works. Somebody's just sent me a message asking about the recobites, whether they're part of the fraternal societies, and yeah. it just flashed up on my screen. Where did that come from? Probably the chat. Um, yeah, but, but how it, do I respond? Oh, um, how do you respond? Who sent it to you? They probably sent a personal me. message. It so, came from oh, me. Robert. Okay. So, uh, right. so Bob, I, uh, down the bottom of the screen, there's a chat function, chat button. And if you press chat, it comes up. And on the right-hand side of your screen, you can see the chats. And, and then you can respond to Robert. So, so you can chat to oh. everyone. But I chose just to send that question to you. And, uh, and if you find it, uh, then you can just re reply to me. Thank you. Um, I didn't know that that toolbar was there, but another question, John, is a number of people have mic uh, headphones on. What is that about? It, it do, does everybody need a headphone? Or? Well, it's only if you don't want to have um, the, the audio uh, open to everybody. It's just going into my ears. Um, but my audio is, is you, you can all hear my audio, but not everyone in my house can hear the discussion here. Right. That's why okay. we use the headphones. Uh, all right. Um, can I answer your question, Robert? Is that the easiest way to do it? Uh, no, we'll do it offline. Oh, I'll okay. send you an email. He'll, he'll send right. you an email. But, but normally you. you can go to that... Uh, that little thing is like a little message and um, and you can reply to me, just send a message to me yeah. uh, just as a side chat. That's what So, so Robert might be able to train you in, in the magical yeah. arts of Zoom. Yes. Bob. <laughs> so, I, was, uh, I was talking with um, Anne earlier. I was having trouble getting onto the Zoom. Oh, and you then successfully it suddenly there. appeared. So I'm not even sure what it was well, that look, I did to make it appear, but it, it just it, it's a pretty good technology, all right? Um, but anyway, look, it's 3 o'clock. Uh, I'd love to thank everyone for being a part of this. Uh, we'll see you next next month, please. You're all welcome. Anyway, I say farewell. I hope you've enjoyed the discussion. I've learned a lot today. Thank you very much for all the contributors and the people who helped other people. Um, thank you, and, John. Uh, stay in touch, stay well, stay safe, and we'll see you next month.
Bye. 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 Cheers. Cheers.